Great. It says we're live. Yeah, I can see a list of attendees. So if you're joining, welcome. We're going to take a few minutes, obviously, just to, uh, to give some time for more people to join. Yeah, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So you can, you maybe can see uh, Melissa uh, posted a, a question, a message, basically in the Q and A chat, and you can answer. So you know, asking where you're coming, where you're from. Um, so I'll answer. I'm actually uh, based in France. We'd love to know where you're coming from, and we'll give we'll give another couple of minutes for more people to join if they're a little late before we get started. So if you're tuning in, welcome. We're going to give everyone another, let's say, one minute, and we're going to start at 10.05 Pacific. Right, I think it's 10.05, so um, I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. This webinar is Ocean for Apache Spark Deep Dive. So we're going to dive deeper into uh, this product that we've been uh, uh, now building for, uh, for, um, for quite some time. Uh, maybe I'll just introduce uh, myself and also Hudson, who, who will also speak later. So uh, my name is Jean-Yves. I go by JY. I'm the product manager for Ocean Spark. I previously uh, co-founded Data Mechanics. Data Mechanics uh, was a startup acquired by Spot.io, and so Ocean Spark is kind of the uh, the integration of uh, Data Mechanics into the Spot.io portfolio with a lot of new uh, exciting features. 
Uh, and just to finish my intro, yeah, I've been working uh, with Spark for a few years now uh, since um, I was working already as a software engineer at Databricks, leading their Spark infrastructure team. Hudson is also with us, one of our solutions architects. Do you want to say a few words, Hudson? Sure, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Hudson. As Joe, I mentioned, I'm a solutions architect. I joined the uh, spot at Ocean for Spark team about eight months ago, and I've been working in the data engineering space or the Spark space for a little over five years now. Great. Thank you, Hudson. And then Ramke uh, is on the chat, so he can answer some questions while you are asking them. Feel free. Uh, and he's our lead solutions architect uh, based out of Pittsburgh with uh, uh, many years of experience in the, in the big data, cloud, and IT space. Uh, so without further ado, uh, this is our agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to do a lot of the talking over slides uh, for the first two sections. And then Hudson is going to give a live demo of Ocean Spark. And then we'll have a, a short, um, uh, yeah, short final, final part where we'll go over uh, customer stories and pricing and how to get started. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to do is just before diving into Ocean Spark, just give a high level intro to Spark on Kubernetes, the architecture, the benefits, the challenges. And before I do, I had a poll. So uh, you should be able to answer this poll uh, using the ON24 um, uh, interface. So you can click uh, to the answers that apply to you. Are you using Spark? Um, and if yes, on which platform? Uh, so the answer is I'm not using Spark using Databricks, using Amazon EMR, using Google Dataproc, using Azure HD Insight, et cetera, et cetera. So please take a few um, uh, seconds to answer that question, and then we should be able to see the answer uh, live. It's always interesting to, uh, to know more where the audience is coming from. All right, yeah, we're getting a lot of answers, giving you another 10 seconds. All right, thank you for answering. Let's see the results. So we have uh, quite a few EMR users and then Databricks comes next as well as on-premise and, uh, and someone who's also uh, new to Spark uh, as well as um, someone uh, who's using Dataproc. Um, so for the person who's new to Spark, very high level intro, um, you probably know a little bit. Spark uh, is a distributed analytics engine for big data. Uh, it makes it easy for Spark developers to um, run applications that process large volumes of data. So in a few lines of code that you write in Python, in Scala, or in SQL, you're going to be able to process hundreds of gigabytes or maybe terabytes or petabytes of data that typically will be stored um, in an object store like S3. But really, virtually any kind of storage is supported by Spark. And why do you do that? The most common use case is going to be ETL, you know, running ETL pipelines. Uh, so where you're going to uh, extract, transform, enrich, clean uh, your data, and then save it back to another system. Uh, Spark streaming, you know, for real-time analysis is also very popular, as well as in general data science, machine learning, business intelligence, and interactive data exploration. Um, so what Spark does is it takes your code and it, ru it runs it on a cluster of machines. What Spark doesn't, doesn't do is actually manage the cluster of the machines. For this, it needs a cluster manager. And so far, the most popular cluster manager was Yarn, which is actually the, the resource manager from Hadoop. Um, and without you know, going too deep into Yarn, uh, at a high level, it works by having a master node with a Yarn resource manager, as well as multiple worker nodes with, again, a Yarn node manager on each of them. And there were some pain points associated with working with Yarn. Uh, for example, you need to pick a global Spark version for your entire cluster. And you also often have shared libraries for your entire uh, Spark cluster, um, and which is not ideal in terms of isolation if you want to be running multiple Spark workloads on the same cluster. As a result, sometimes people will use transient cluster. Uh, that's very common, for example, in EMR. You spin up an EMR cluster, run your job, you shut it down, which is better in terms of stability, but it also increases the cost because spinning up a yarn cluster takes, yeah, it can take five, 10 minutes at least. Um, 
The other pain point is that there is no native support for Docker. So most people actually um, directly modify their AMIs to make changes. And there can be subtle uh, environment changes between different, uh, different places. Uh, and maybe the, the last maybe pain point associated with Yard is that uh, there's, there's a bit of resource overhead. I should also say there's a management overhead because you need to learn Yarn. Uh, but, but definitely just in terms of resource, uh, the Yarn node manager, Yarn resource manager are JVM processes that do uh, eat a, a certain amount of resource. Uh, now, Spark on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, is another cluster manager for Spark, which came uh, recently. It started in 2018. Um, and uh, by opposition, it's very popular for um, deployments of Spark today. So one of the benefits of running on Kubernetes is that your Spark applications will be running as uh, Docker containers. And so uh, Docker is natively uh, supported, which makes dependency management a lot simpler, and which also means that uh, you can run your application locally or in staging or in production and know that the environment is going to be exactly the same right like the operating system the libraries the smart version will be exactly the same also uh, docker containers are very lightweight or very fast to start up uh, which means that you can actually uh, start your applications on kubernetes in a matter of a few seconds uh, the other benefit and which is also a consequence of that is that on a single kubernetes cluster you can run um, many different Spark applications. You can mix different Spark versions. You could also mix, by the way, Spark and non-Spark workloads. And you can obviously mix use cases. So you could have a single Kubernetes cluster and have both uh, interactive notebooks running, batch jobs, streaming jobs, etc. Uh, and finally, I mean, the other main reason why people are so excited about Kubernetes is because it's a great uh, cloud agnostic uh, technology, uh, very popular with many uh, open source tools that plug with it. So if you want to, I don't know, install some networking solution, monitoring solution, um, uh, management, uh, uh, monitoring, it's it's super easy and you can just uh, use all these tools. And so uh, now that Spark can run on Kubernetes, you don't need to have a separate infrastructure for um, f just for big data. You can use the same uh, tool, which is Kubernetes, to manage your infrastructure across your entire tech stack. So, as I told you, uh, Kubernetes support started in 2018, but by then it was really bare bone. Uh, as as the project matured, as many companies started contributing to it, uh, it, it picked up a lot of steam. And really, I would say that today it is the most common uh, deployment model for, for Spark, when you, when you do a new deployment at least, right? Um, in, with Spark 3.0, it got, in particular, very important improvements uh, like uh, dynamic allocation, the ability to add and remove Spark executors at runtime. And uh, last year, with Spark 3.1, the Spark on Kubernetes integration was uh, officially declared as generally available and production ready. People were already using it in production, but now it was officially recognized you know, by all the, all the Spark committers. Um, and in particular, at that time, there were some new features that maybe we'll, we'll mention some of them, such as the ability to uh, automatically um, anticipate a spot kill and move shuffle files around. Uh, that was a very interesting feature, as well as the ability, ability to mount NFS volumes. Uh, and uh, in October last year, Spark 3.2 was released, which gave another few improvements. Uh, in particular, I'd like to mention the very uh, uh, nice performance improvement that we got with uh, faster S3 writes using the magic committer. Uh, however, I should say that you know I've been working with Spark and Kubernetes for a few years now, and it's also um, it's also it can be um, a lot to learn at the very beginning, and it can be a lot to uh, to manage and to maintain. And this is why there are managed products like us that uh, try to make Spark and Kubernetes easy. So if you really uh, want to do Spark on Kubernetes open source, uh, it's a lot of infrastructure to, to set up in the first place, like installing the cluster, sure, uh, installing the uh, open source Spark operator that makes uh, Spark on Kubernetes easy, installing the Spark history server, building your Docker images, uh, enabling auto scaling on the cluster. Uh, and once you're done, uh, you're not really done because uh, you have to uh, look at uh, integrations. So if you want to have some uh, 
visibility into your logs, into your metrics. You're going to have to uh, integrate with observability tools. You probably want to integrate the Jupyter Notebooks with uh, Airflow or another orchestrator with a meta store so that you can persist the metadata about your tables um, as well as other things. And even then, you're not done because uh, you're going to run into um, uh, stability issues, performance issues, and that's where you probably need to look at implementing certain optimizations. Um, I just listed a few things that were very important for us, such as picking the right size for your pods, um, configuring the use of spot instances, because spot instances can be up to 90% cheaper than the on-demand price, um, enabling dynamic allocation, using local NVMe-based SSDs to store shuffle files, which can give a 5 to 10x performance improvement, um, as well as more stuff. So as you can see, uh, um, this is why many companies always um, choose some kind of managed service provider to work with Spark. Uh, and, and so you have, you have the choice between many different platforms. And today we're going to obviously talk about Ocean Spark. And I think at a high level, our goal is to make Spark really developer friendly and also uh, cost effective. And that's kind of what I want to show you and tell you about uh, with, um, by presenting Ocean Spark. So we're going to start um, uh, diving into the products more. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, Ocean Spark uh, is now generally available on AWS. Actually, we're going to announce it only um, about 10 days from now. But um, yeah, we've been we've been hardening the product. We've been adding a lot of feature recently, and so we're going to declare it as GA on AWS. And then GCP and Azure will be coming next. So stay tuned uh, for the next few uh, weeks uh, and months. Uh, so now I want to give an overview of some of the, the features of OceanSpark. Uh, first, native dockerization. I already mentioned that. That's not actually a feature of OceanSpark. It's more a feature of uh, Spark and Kubernetes in general. The, uh, the benefit of using Docker is that you control the, uh, the Docker images that you build, and you can put all your dependencies, like your libraries, your uh, jars, your Python libraries in there. And then... Um, and then you don't need to download them at runtime. And then you can run that Docker image maybe locally for dev and testing. And then you can run it at scale and have a very fast iteration cycle. One thing that we do provide compared to just you know uh, doing it yourself is we maintain a fleet of Spark Docker images that are ready to run. Um, we call that a fleet because we actually have to maintain a mix of different versions. So we, we, have, we support Spark 2.4 to Spark 3.2. We support different versions of Python, of Java, of Scala, of Hadoop, and other libraries. Uh, in particular, we support all the libraries that make it easy to, to read from uh, S3, to read from uh, Snowflake, to read from Delta, to read from uh, Google Cloud Storage, Azure uh, Data Lake also. Um, and I think there are more uh, such integrations uh, coming. And so we maintain this, these images, which means that whenever a new uh, Spark release comes in, we uh, we will release all the uh, all the related images and we will test them and make them available um, for for our customers. Uh, and just to give you at a high level what the developer workflow with Docker looks like, but but Hudson will actually show it to you later in the demo. Is um, you're going to be maybe developing from your IDE and then in a single command you can build and run uh, your Docker image locally, maybe for dev and testing, or uh, you can actually um, build a Docker image, push it to a Docker registry, and run that image at scale on your production Kubernetes cluster. And you know that it's going to be the same environment, and you can, you can have like a 30-second iteration cycle, even if you deploy in the cloud at scale. So uh, it really, it's really a game changer. It, I think uh, it means that you're going to be able to do a lot more development from your IDE rather than working from a notebook. Notebooks are still really useful, but many people, you know, start enjoying the the the, the feeling of developing from an IDE. Um, second thing that we do provide to make Spark more developer friendly are integrations, uh, and so you, you'll see that in the demo: integration with Jupyter, integration with Airflow, integration with other schedulers, uh, because we actually provide a, a REST API that makes it easy to submit Spark applications from anywhere. Uh, and then, obviously, you also benefit from the Docker and Kubernetes ecosystem. So any tool that works with Docker, that works with Kubernetes, um, can work with, uh, with Spark on Kubernetes. 
Um, last thing that we provide is uh, a user interface where you can see your application logs. You can also see the Spark UI and you can see uh, the system metrics of your application, such as IO usage, CPU usage, memory usage. And this information is available while the app is running, but it's also persisted so that you can, uh, if, if you had a pipeline you know, that ran during the night and that had some kind of stability issue, well, when you come in the morning, you can find the relevant logs, the relevant metrics and, and troubleshoot. And, and we'll do our best to have like intuitive U UI that uh, show you where, what the issue is uh, and, and make Spark more, more easy to understand. Um, and so this, inf and I should also say that if you start running an app regularly, this information is persisted and you can track uh, the uh, evolution of your stability, of your cloud cost, of your Spark efficiency over time. Uh, now, I just want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure. And there's a lot that we could say here because uh, Ocean Spark builds on top of Ocean, which is the managed uh, uh, Kubernetes offering of Spot.io. And really, it could be an entire webinar could be dedicated to it. But I just want to focus on a few important things on the on the infrastructure side. So first, obviously, it runs on Kubernetes and it runs in your cloud account. Uh, and uh, Ocean Spark is going to take care of automatically scaling that cluster up and down. So you don't have you don't you don't need to have a fixed size. You don't need to manage which type of instance, which node pools to put in there. Uh, this will happen automatically. So as you submit Spark applications, we'll provision um, uh, instances and add them to your cluster. And we support, uh, and by the way, we also support spot and on-demand as well as reserved instances. And if you use spot instances, which is something we, we do recommend to enable a lot of cost savings, we make that even easier because uh, we can actually, rather than... Um, Rather than targeting a specific instance type, like some uh, some products will require you, like Amazon EMR will say, oh, which instance type do you want to use? We will actually uh, automatically uh, let you um, uh, optimize which type of instance to put that satisfies your workload requirements and that minimizes the spot cost as well as minimizes the probability of having a spot interruption. Uh, so that's that's some of the things on the infrastructure side that you also see uh, live during the demo. Uh, so the Kubernetes cluster can scale up and down, but each Spark application running on it can also scale up and down. Uh, so that's called uh, Spark auto-scaling or, or dynamic allocation. Uh, and Spark can gracefully handle spot kills. Uh, I won't go too deep into this right now, but basically when we when we are warned by Amazon that a spot kill is about to happen, we have a two-minute notice, and during this two-minute notice, we can proactively move shuffle files around so that you don't lose uh, the shuffle files when the spot kill happens. And last thing on the optimized infrastructure size, Ocean Spark uh, will automatically tune certain infrastructure parameters and Spark configurations to make your Spark pipelines more stable and more performant. So what are the things that we tune? Container sizes. Uh, number of Spark partitions, size of your um, num sorry number of Spark executors, as well as specific uh, Spark feature flags, and these optimizations, some of them some of them are just um, based on on the rules. So oh, we see your input and we determine you know uh, what is number of partitions to use, and some of them are based on the on the historical performance of your Spark pipelines. So what that means is that if you schedule a pipeline to run regularly, like every day at 3 a.m., uh, then we will use the data uh, that we analyzed from the previous runs to automatically tune and adapt the configuration for the, for the next execution of that pipeline. All right, so we're getting closer to, uh, to giving you a demo of the product. Um, but last slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the infrastructure again to, uh, to recap. So you're gonna have an, an Ocean Spark cluster in your cloud account, let's say in your Amazon account. Uh, it's actually running on EKS. So Ocean Spark does not replace you know, EKS, it just builds on top of it. Uh, the data obviously is going to be stored in your cloud account, whatever whatever storage that you want to use. And then, as a as a Spark user, what you're going to do is you're going to submit a Dockerized Spark application on that Kubernetes cluster. And so you could be running literally thousands of Spark applications in parallel on a single Kubernetes cluster. 
And each Spark application is going to have one Spark driver and a number of Spark uh, executor pods, which can which can vary. And then, um, how will you submit these applications? Well, you can either uh, start Jupyter Notebooks, which means that you're going to interact with Spark um, in an interactive way, right? Uh, or you can submit them from a scheduler uh, like Airflow, uh, Jenkins, Argo, and others. Uh, or you can also, you know, build your own CI/CD pipelines that directly just call our, our REST API. Uh, uh, so, and, and last thing I should say, maybe just on the security side, this can be deployed in your VPC. You can make the, the cluster um, private uh, if need be. And, um, um, and we don't need any access to, to, your, to your data. Uh, Spot.io does not have access to your data. This is all stored securely uh, in your cloud. Um, without further ado, I think I will uh, give the mic to, uh, to Hudson, who will give the, the demo of OceanSpark. Um, uh, maybe just to introduce the demo, I think Hudson will show you how to work interactively using Jupyter Notebooks. He will also show you the Airflow integration. And then you will see our, our, our web interface that lets you monitor uh, your Spark applications as well as your communities cluster uh, as a whole. Uh, Hudson, back to you. OK, great. Thanks, JY. Uh, so like JY mentioned, uh, can you guys all, everybody can see my screen OK? Yes. I don't know how we'll find out, but yes, great. Um, so there are a few different methods that we can use to submit apps to the Ocean for Spark platform. The first one being uh, running Jupyter Notebooks on the platform. To start a Jupyter Notebook, it's going to look very similar to how you normally start Jupyter Notebooks in your terminal, right? <clears throat> Just calling the Jupyter Notebook command um, with a few extra arguments, though. We have the gateway client URL. Um, we're going to pass in the backend data or Ocean for Spark API to the gateway client. And what this means is your code will still live on your local notebook, but the actual execution kernel will be on the Ocean for Spark backend in a Spark application. You'll also pass in a auth token that you create in the spot uh, console, as well as a timeout. And this just allows uh, a little bit of time for the application to start before uh, we begin executing. So let's actually run it. And if we go back over to So what we have here is a pretty straightforward notebook. Uh, we are reading some uh, atmospheric data. I will, if we go over to the console, we'll actually see this cluster beginning to start. OK, great. And then note the number of cores here. We're actually at zero cores. The application is pending. Uh, we're waiting to see this application get its driver so it can actually start working. And great, it has an executor is running as well. So we can begin running this notebook. Um, like I said, uh, just basically reading some CSV data, doing a few transformations, and then um, displaying a few plots with matplotlib. So if we go back into the console, this is kind of the application view screen. Um, when the application is complete, you'll see some summary metrics like uh, cost of the application, data read, data written, as well as some efficiency metrics that I'll go into later. You'll also have access to both the Kubernetes logs and the driver log. So like I mentioned, uh, the Kubernetes logs are really helpful in seeing exactly when your driver was provisioned, when the image was pulled onto the driver, when your executors are running, when your cluster is scaling up, which is actually what we can see here. We started off with uh, one executor, I believe, with four cores. Um, if we keep an eye on this cores number, this will actually grow throughout the life of the application because what we've done is enabled dynamic allocation, um, which is effectively the auto-scaling mechanism for Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, I won't go into that too much uh, to get too technical, but just know that it, it works really well and you should see that auto-scaling happening shortly. But if we look back over at the driver logs, we'll see tasks are actually being executed. So our Spark uh, application is running, and we should see a few notebook commands uh, that have completed. Going back to the Spot console, um, one other aspect kind of that we've created is this uh, idea of a configuration template. And these configuration templates can be thought of as basically Spark environments. Um, you're able to specify things like image, uh, main application file, Spark configuration settings, as well as the resources for your driver and executor, things like environment variables. You can mount volumes. There's really a ton of flexibility that we provide for you with this 
configuration object. You can define these objects as templates and then reference them throughout your, um, your applications. So say you have you know, a large number of applications that all require one executor with four cores, you won't have to um, repeat that config in each application. You can just reference that config template um, in the API. So while this is running, we're actually going to kick off the second mode of deployment that we have, and that's actually through Airflow. Uh, so we've created a Airflow operator that allows you to really easily submit applications to the platform. Uh, there's really two steps to set up this Airflow operator. The first, um, you just add a pip install the Ocean for Spark operator, relatively straightforward. Um, you can run Airflow manage, you can run it locally, you can run it in a, you know, any deployment method that you choose, this will work. So after you pip install, you'll have uh, access to this Ocean Spark connection where you will provide a cluster ID, um, which is just some metadata that we reference from config, as well as a uh, account ID, which is your Spark uh, spot account ID, and as well as an API token. And we'll show you a little bit of example of what this DAG looks like. For those who are, uh, I think most people probably know, but uh, for those unaware, Airflow is a very popular scheduling and orchestration tool in the data engineering community. So we have a few DAGs here. Um, we're kicking off, I believe, the same job in both Python and Scala. Uh, this is a really simple word count application that we've used uh, with some data in an S3 bucket. Um, a few things you'll note over here, this config overrides object that you're looking at, this should look very similar to the configuration templates that I was just showing you because it's the exact same JSON. Um, a few things to note here, this main application file, um, there's kind of two ways that you structure your code to run on the, day, on the Ocean for Spark platform. The first being, um, you can actually reference a file in S3. So if you have a jar or a Python file, you can put it into an S3 bucket or not, a similar object storage location and reference it directly from the cluster. And we'll take that file, mount it on top of a Docker image and run your Spark code. Um, in addition to that, what other interesting things are in this config? Also, yeah, you have this uh, instance selector. This is really interesting because um, with this uh, Ocean for Spark release, this instance selector provides us the ability to not only specify a specific instance type like M5X large, we also have the ability to specify an instance family. And this is really cool because it allows us to fully take advantage of the Ocean platform, which is really built around uh, gaining efficiencies through using spot instances, things like predictability models across availability zones, regions, and instance types. So. By specifying this R5 instance family to kind of provide an example here, we have uh, an application with an, two executors and four cores. So there's a few different configuration options that we could use to meet our resource requests. So let's say we're using R5 X large instances. R5 X large instances, I believe, have four cores. We would, uh, if you were using, say, let's say Spot determined that. R5 X large instances are the best spot instances used for this application. They have the lowest spot time weight, they're the least likelihood of spot kill. So it will select two R5 X large instances to fit this configuration. Now let's say instead of R5 X large, 2XL is actually the, the best method or the best selection at this time. It will select an R5 2X large and you'll have two pods running on one instance, both with four cores each. So you will not lose any resources. You'll have the same resources either way. Your costs will be exactly the same, but your applications will run more consistently and reliably. Um, I guess a few other things. You have the ability, like I said earlier, to mount environment variables. Um, you can also mount volumes. And here is an example of a the same application just written in Scala and referencing a jar. And then lastly, we have a, another operation uh, just running spark.py, and you'll notice that this main application file has a local path, and this is an example of uh, where we've actually mounted that jar onto a Docker image that um, the client has created and will send to the backend. So let's actually kick off this tag. Great. And if we go back over to the console, I believe we should see this notebook has finished, and you'll see some time series information. And if we actually kill this notebook, we'll see some summary data shortly. I guess I'll show you the application is still running. Um, 
one interesting thing to note also, uh, the notebook clusters will continue to run until you physically shut them down. But you'll quickly notice that the cores have scaled down uh, drastically. You only have one core, which I believe is for our driver. And this is, again, one of the uh, major benefits of the platform is the auto scaling functionality that Spark and Kubernetes provides for us because it really works so well and so quickly. And we see so many of our customers uh, achieving significant cost savings uh, when they're frequent notebook users because they're no longer running large notebook clusters for an entire day or a week or month. When they're not using them, those clusters scale down and they save costs and they only scale up when it's time to actually execute. Um, let's go into one of the Airflow DAGs that we kicked off. I believe this application should be running. Uh, just about see that executor running. But either way, um, you'll have access to the Spark UI once this application is kicked off, where you know your general Spark UI, you can see executors, um, tasks, all that good stuff. And this will also be uh, available in the Spark history server after the application has completed and we maintain that Spark history server for you. Okay, uh, the last method that I will discuss today is um, so going into that CI/CD process that we had discussed earlier, like I said, um, most of our customers choose to run data mechanics on Docker. They build their own Docker images instead of uh, taking a jar and just throwing it in S3. And the reason for that is um, usually Spark applications require that you're installing some libraries or some packages, creating environment variables. There's some customization, customization beyond just taking a jar and putting it on one of our base Docker images. So. This is kind of an example of a very simple CI CD process. Say this is a GitHub action where your code has just been merged to master or main, and then you run your tests. The next step would be, let's actually build this Docker image, or you know, we'll take the jar or the Python script that you've just validated, and we will mount it onto this Docker file. Here's a very simple example of what that Docker file would look like. This is one of the base Docker images that uh, JY mentioned earlier that we support, and you can find the entire uh, list or matrix of options that we support on our Docker Hub. And what we're doing here, just a few environment variable settings, creating a working dir. We're copying a requirements.txt file over and installing those libraries. And then we're just copying our code over so we can actually execute it. Um, and then if we go down a little bit, uh, we're going to run this, this command. Sorry, this is a just file for those unfamiliar. It's very similar to a make file, which is just like a, um, a nicer way to run shell commands um, with some arguments and functionality built in. We're going to run this command in just a second. That is going to first update. We're going to build this Docker image and push it to our repository. And then it's actually going to submit an application to the backend API just using a general REST, REST request. Um, so we're going to post to our cluster URL uh, with this account ID, include the API token, and then some configuration settings. They're just specifying that it's a Python application, the Spark version the image that we're pushing to, as well as the main application file that's located on that Docker image. So let's do that now. We'll see this Docker image is building locally. I had already done this before, so it's pushing very quickly. And then we'll actually see the JSON return from that post request uh, will include the URL to the application, as well as um, just the just some like general metadata about the application, including your config uh, that you provided previously. So if we go back to the spot console, we should see this application beginning to start. And we also should see, okay, while the airflow job is running, um, one of two other kind of like logical concepts that I wanna discuss before we end the demo. Um, so we use this concept of jobs uh, to kind of organize Spark applications. So we define Spark applications as just any running of a Spark code, whether that's a block of a Jupyter notebook or just some Spark code that you're executing. A job is more like an airflow DAG, some kind of a repeated task over time. And the reason why this is a relatively important concept for us, it allows us to um, keep track of your job's resources and performance metrics over time so that we can apply some auto-tuning functionality, um, things like changing executors or changing resources, things that will make your application more uh, more efficient. So, you know, some ways that our API can work, we can notice that data volumes, for instance, increase at certain times and increase the size of the cluster. And that's just one of the many auto-tuning uh, pieces of functionality that we hope to offer and will offer. Um, 
But on this job page, you're provided with some uh, really interesting metrics, median cloud costs. This includes the, uh, the EC2 costs as well as the platform costs. We have the duration of the job, the data read, data written. You have a little bit of a graph, so you can plot things like uh, data written against duration, for instance. Yep, that makes sense. Those two should probably be pretty correlated. Uh, and then below, you'll have the ability to jump into individual application runs. So applica Spark applications roll up to Spark jobs, um, and that's like a logical organization feature that we provide. And you'll see some of that same data displayed on the application view screen. Uh, real quick, this efficiency score, this is just a way that we use on our back end to kind of do some of that auto tuning. Um, I think JY will get into the pricing in just a second, but if we go back, um, to the application screen. Once we get something that's running uh, or finished, we should see this duration. Okay, so this duration is, uh, it's actually the time that your Spark cores are exiting work, not the time that your EC2 instances are, uh, are alive. And so basically to summarize that, you won't be getting charged for application startup time, for uh, Kubernetes scale up time, by the platform, you will not be getting charged for that. You're only getting charged for Spark work that is being done by your course. Um, and this efficiency score is basically the amount of time that your Spark cores are executing work divided by the overall time that your instances are up. Um, and this is just a metric. It's not a perfect metric, but it's something that we utilized to judge the efficiency of your applications and try to decide what the best tuning scenarios might be. And the last thing I will show before I hand off, um, this is just a cluster overview page. If you go, sorry, skipped over this. Um, this is a you know, dev environment that we have on our spot account. You can see multiple clusters can be viewed within the same spot account. And if we dive into the cluster that we were just running, you'll see some summary metrics across the entire cluster, cloud cost, and see the number of core hours, data read, data written, as well as um, some graphs at the end that you can use to play around, see app completion trends, uh, the time it takes to load an application, things like that. And we should see most of those applications uh, have completed. And I think that's about it. Um, otherwise, I will hand it off to JY. Yeah, thank you so much for that demo, Hudson. Uh, we'll be able to uh, answer any kind of questions you have at the end of the webinar, and we're getting close to that. So feel free to add your questions to the to the Q and A section. And um, and yeah, I just wanted to close uh, by just going over our pricing and a few uh, customer case studies. Um, so uh, Hudson just mentioned, you know, one of the metrics that you can see in our UI is Spark number of Spark core hours. And so basically, if you have one Spark driver that is up with one core, and then you have maybe four Spark executors with four cores each, well, then all grouped together, you're using 17 uh, cores. And so if you run that such an application for an hour, uh, we will charge you uh, about 40 cents for it. Uh, so there's no fee on memory usage. There is no uh, rounding. You know, if you run an application for just uh, 10 seconds, you'll pay for just 10 seconds. Uh, and so that's that's what Hudson meant, that we only charge a fee when Spark cores are running. And so our goal is to manage your infrastructure efficiently so that we can reduce your um, EC2, you know, your Amazon spend uh, and, and get the same job done using less EC2 machines. Uh, and on average, I would say that um, when people compare us to their alternative, which could be Databricks, which could be EMR, which could be uh, um, running Spark and Spark on Kubernetes or Spark on Yarn, uh, do it yourself. We enable 50 to 75% cost looking at total cost of ownership. Uh, so just to illustrate that, I wanted to, to show a few customer stories. Um, in particular, we are lucky to be working with the United Nations who, uh, who use our platform to really power uh, a global force of, um, of statistici statisticians around the world. Um, they used to be working on uh, EMR cluster, uh, which they found to be uh, uh, slow and uh, expensive and had some stability issues with. And now uh, we have all these uh, statisticians uh, worldwide uh, running on, on OceanSpark instead. We enabled 70% cost savings, and then the, uh, the Dockerization gave them a lot of uh, additional stability 
uh, ease of use and, and stability around the use of, of libraries, because in particular they're they're using um, geo libraries um, because they're they're actually working on the um, uh, it's 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 a task force that works on the uh, AIS data, which is data about the position of vessels around the world. Uh, another customer I wanted to mention is Weather 2020. They're actually a weather analytics platform, and uh, they're a typical like small data engineering team who wanted to get started with Spark. And we were lucky that from uh, really in three weeks they went from zero to having production pipelines uh, scheduled with Airflow, uh, processing terabytes of data uh, in S3. And so they really enjoy the developer um, friendliness of the platform. They were coming over from Databricks and they, uh, they benchmarked us during the POC and found us to be 60% uh, less expensive than Databricks. Uh, in fact, and that was back then when we started working together, because uh, since then we actually had another huge improvements on their jobs with the Spark 3.2 release. Uh, because the magic committer improvement, which is a, an improvement when you write data to S3, actually got a 65% additional speed up on, on their job. So now if, if we were comparing with Databricks, we would see even more important um, savings. Um, I'll be sending the slides afterwards and you'll have access to the links because there are specific blog posts that dive into these, uh, these use cases. Uh, I think the, the last use case I wanted to mention is a uh, is large EMR customer that migrated um, with, uh, to data mechanics. And really, uh, we, we got huge improvements uh, in, this, in this transition. First, they reduced their Amazon cost by two thirds, but also and that was very important, you know, to their uh, to their users because Link is actually a data platform themselves, and so their their users um, are are waiting for Spark applications to finish. And we got their Spark application startup time to be halved, and we got the Spark application duration to be also uh, almost almost halved. Uh, so really great great uh, improvement in terms of cost, in terms of user experience. Uh, and I think the, the last thing that their uh, that their co-founder really likes is the fact that they can rely on our team to uh, um, to work with them and, and and provide them the Spark support that they need. Uh, so I think uh, this is it. We're we're almost at the end of the webinar. I just wanted to let you know if you're interested in Ocean Spark, what you should do is you should schedule a call with our team. Uh, you'll either be on a call with me or Hudson or Ramkey, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll discuss your use case, advise how to tackle it, and then, yeah, define the scope and success criteria of how to do a, a POC together. Um, once you're past that stage, uh, you will actually, you know, create a spot.io account and then follow our documentation on, on getting started. You know, you can create uh, the cluster uh, yourself using Terraform, CloudFormation, SpotCTL. Uh, if you already have a communities cluster, you can also import it into OceanSpark. And then at a high level, you know, how do you get started once you have your cluster? Well, you're going to configure your Spark applications so that they can access the data, you know, whether, whether it is on S3, um, uh, cloud, a data warehouse, whatever. Uh, you can do this using Kubernetes secret or using an IAM role. Uh, you're going to package your code uh, either in a Docker image, which we recommend, or by just storing a jar or a Python file on S3 or any kind of storage. And then uh, the final step will be connecting your tools, you know, whether it's Jupyter, Airflow, CI CD tool. And, uh, and that's pretty much, you know, the flow of, of getting started. And really in two to three weeks, we can see great results. We can really see you uh, go from zero to production and, and, and definitely uh, hit our, the success criteria of a POC. Um, Last thing I wanted to say is we have another webinar. It's scheduled for about a month from now, early April, uh, same time on a Wednesday. And that webinar will be uh, will dive deeper into performance tuning tips uh, that were applied on you know real world customer uh, pipelines. And so you'll see how we can achieve a very significant uh, cost savings, stability improvements, performance improvements uh, by you know by going through a series of use cases and. Hopefully, we'll be able to to name uh, some of these customers that uh, that we were able to uh, to help with. Uh, so some of the things that we'll go over will be yeah tuning the the number of partitions for Spark. We'll go about memory tuning. We'll go about using a local NVMe based SSDs. We'll go over the magic committer. We'll go over improvements to make Spark work reliably on spot instances. 
so yeah, I just wanted to uh, to end the webinar with this, uh, maybe as a sneak peek. Like this is a screenshot of one of our uh, user interface called Delight, where you can really troubleshoot what is the performance bottleneck of an application. And in particular, there's a change that we did here that enabled a 10x performance improvements for one of our customers. So that's one of the things we'll, we'll go over, we'll explain, we'll show you how to use it. Even if you're not a customer, this should be a very interesting um, uh, webinar to to learn some some tricks of being successful with uh, with spark on kubernetes and uh, that is it i think we're gonna go to uh, to q a now thank you so much everyone all right so there was a couple of questions that were already answered in writing i can see there's a new question from uh, jean-luc um that says NVIDIA promotes GPU acceleration for machine learning, but also for plain data frame processing. Do you see any interest about that in the field? Um, for plain data frame, do you mean for um, Spark data frame? Um, do we see interest about that? Uh, it does come up every now and then, but I would really still say that it's a, a minority of uh, customers and prospects we talk to who are who are interested in running Spark on GPUs. Uh, so there there is interest. Uh, we know a few competitors uh, provide that as an option, but I would say it is uh, less than less than five percent, maybe even less than one or two percent of of Spark users who uh, who do that. Um, not sure, Hassan, if you have more of a comment there. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, we do have, uh, we will be supporting GPUs for like machine learning workloads. Um, but no, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen too many instances where people just want to run normal uh, Spark transformations on GPUs. But I could, I could see, um, I could see the use cases for it. Um, and once we support GPUs, it'll be um, something that the platform can definitely offer. And um, I'm just uh, jumping to another question, question number 10 by uh, Mohinder Dick. You mentioned cost savings in, in TCO. Can you confirm that these percentages include your fees too and not just the reduction in Amazon spend? Yes, absolutely. So when, when we do a POC, the key metric is TCO, total cost of ownership. And so we compare before, let's say you're using EMR. So we compare the cost of the EC2 machines for running Spark plus the EMR service fee. And we compare that to uh, the cost of EC2 after your migration plus the cost of our service fee. And so the, the, the savings that we generated are in terms of TCO. We, we very often see 50, 60, 70% um, savings in terms of total cost of ownership. Maybe just to, uh, to list at a high level, where do these savings come from? They come from first the architecture of running on Kubernetes rather than Yarn, which is more um, where, in, where Docker containers spin up faster and it's easier to share resources. They come from um, better auto-scaling algorithm. They come from using spot nodes. They come from specific uh, Spark uh, optimizations that we have in the platform. They come from some of the auto-tuning features that we mentioned. Uh, and lastly, our product shows you, you, you've seen it during the demo, our product shows you the cost of running the Amazon cost associated with running each pipeline, as well as our fee associated with running with each pipeline in the product. And so it also drives more cost conscious behavior. And you start to realize, oh, <laughs> this pipeline is responsible for a big portion of my cost. And maybe uh, um, and maybe using our user interfaces, you'll see how to, how to improve on it. Um, great. I think we went through... Um, most of the question, I can see that Melissa mentioned a few things that in the resource section, you can uh, download the product overview and check a few blog posts. Uh, you can also sign up to our next webinar in April, and you can also uh, schedule a time to, uh, to talk to our team using the Calendly link. Uh, so I think um, this is it, and maybe we can we can call it a day. Feel free to also reach out to us, type our name on LinkedIn, add us there if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, in writing. Happy to happy to do that. All right, I think I'll uh, I'll cut my video now. 
thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day or evening. Bye-bye.